a biblical teacher. Uh, he's very sound. He's very detailed, uh, sometimes too much. Um, but when uh, here we are um, taking almost an entire year to talk about what does it mean to be the church and what does the Bible say about being the church versus traditions that we grew up with and this is the way we usually do things, that kind of thing. What does Scripture say? And so it, it made me remember um, a sermon he preached a whole lot of years ago and he began to lay out a plan for the church. And so when he started laying out this plan for the church, man, I was taking notes. And I still have my notes. So this is, um, this is my father-in-law in the message preached many years ago. This is his plan for the church taken from Acts chapter 2. Okay? It starts with salvations. It starts with people hearing the gospel, getting gloriously saved, moving from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. When that begins to happen, it creates this kind of reputation. That's the church where things are happening. That's the church where new believers are coming in. That's the church um, where um, there's some uh, going and blowing, as my uh, previous pastor used to say. Um, and uh, so it begins with salvations, and then we kind of make a name for ourselves in the community as the place, right? That, obviously, the church is going to grow. We get more numbers. Um, that creates a, a, a praise atmosphere. You know, we're praising God. Everyone's going to be happy, basically. It's going to be a, a very enthusiastic kind of place, right? Um, that, in turn, that kind of contentment, is what inspires and encourages people to kind of turn loose of their stuff uh, physically and, you know, time-wise. And, you know, you're, you're meeting others' needs, like Scott talked about last week. Um, did a great job from the end of Acts chapter 2. Um, if we meet people's needs, that will bring us together in unity. You know, we'll all be striving toward one goal, one mind. Um, out of that unity, miracles sometimes take place, like you know, with me or, uh, you know, we just prayed for Jim. Uh, the awe of God rests on a people that are experiencing miracles. And um, that means even more commitment and, again, more people coming. That will almost automatically bring more salvations and the process begins over again. That's 11 steps, and I don't know if any of you tried to take notes. I hope not. But that's 11 steps that he laid out. I don't know if you tracked all that, but it sounds kind of perfect, doesn't it? You start with salvations and you end with salvations. And in between, there's all this activity and wonderful things happening in the church and maybe even miracles and all that kind of stuff. My question is, did you hear any flaws, any obvious flaws? And the first time I heard the message, like, no. So right about then, I'm looking at my notes and I'm, I'm plotting the, you know, the largest church in Kansas City. I, I'm, I'm plotting like, this is the way to do it. Let's, let's, let's go. And then my father-in-law says something like, if we grew a church that way, and we could, we would be moving in the exact opposite direction that God led his church in the book of Acts. Because those 11 steps are Acts chapter 2 in reverse. And I went, oh. <laughs> well, that's just silly. Uh, what? What? And he pointed out that plan is also missing the most important part, the most crucial part for a church, for us as of, of, of just as people, uh, for us to thrive. And, and I bring all that up not as a gotcha. I hope you know me better than that. I'm not. I'm not trying to lead you down a path and go, "Ha, huh, you're wrong." I'm not doing that. <laughs> What I'm doing is, um, well, it's an illustration of how easy it is to enter into unbiblical practices. Because, I mean, granted, I'm young at that time, but I'm taking notes. I mean, this is the plan for the church, and that looked good, but it was unbiblical. Just because it's practical, just because it might even be effective, does not give us the right to change what God has said. Mark Dever is a, a pastor in Washington, D.C. I think he's still there. 
And uh, this is what he says on this topic. This, this, this is gold. Christians are required to gather as churches. Therefore, when a church decides to implement a non-biblical practice, it effectively requires Christians to approach God through that non-biblical practice. Did you catch that? If we introduce something into the service that is not biblical, because we are gathered to meet God, we, as leaders, would be asking the church to meet God in an unbiblical way. Dever says, in the Bible, human inventions were again and again called idolatrous. One of the things that separated the false gods from the true God in the Old Testament is that the false gods were mute while the true gods spoke. That is Psalm 115. Listen to this. People can creatively devise how to approach a mute God, but they must listen to a speaking God. So if we make up our own way of how to get to God, anything goes. But that's not God. That's a God of our own making. What scripture calls on us to do is to listen to and submit to his plan and his ways. Dever says, depravity makes us unreliable guides. In other words, our, our, our darkened hearts. We need God's self-revelation or we are lost. Everything my own church does in our time together on Sunday morning, we do in obedience to God's word. To observe that scripture is, quote, sufficient is to observe that it's sufficient for helping us do whatever God would have us do. And in the Bible, God demonstrates that he does care about the organization and the structure of the local church. That's why we started all of this with the authority of Scripture. That's why we started all of this with, can we count on this Bible to tell us things? Um, that series of questions that Scott posed last week, um, I don't know what church he was talking about, by the way. He kind of looked at me and like winked, like I knew, but I didn't. Uh, why not here? Why not now? Why not us? Yeah, let's do that. But only if it's thoroughly grounded in Scripture. What I want us to get to as we keep studying Acts, as we go to 1 Corinthians, as we probably look at, yeah, probably, yeah, 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy, Titus, those kind of passages. I want us to compare what we're actually doing with what we see in Scripture and then reorient our lives around what Scripture says. That's the goal here. Um, so, for example, um, he very briefly mentioned it last week, but he, he talked about how in Scripture, um, the communion was during their meals. By the way, do you know why we eat together every month? It's not because, well, we're sort of Baptist, and Baptists have potlucks. It's because Acts 2 says they ate together. That's why. That, that whole idea, by the way, was from Scott. He's the one that led that. Um, do you know why we pray? Do you know why there's a pastoral prayer? Because scripture is really clear that uh, elders and pastors are to be examples to the flock. So part of the reason why we pray is to be a model of prayer. And Public corporate prayer was a part of every gathering. That's why we do these things. It's not because uh, uh, it's not because we want to add something. It's not. Be it's because it's here. Um, so he very much uh, briefly mentioned that the, the Lord's Supper was actually a part of the meals. So I think we ought to try that. Um, May, the second Sunday in May, is Mother's Day. We're not touching Mother's Day with a feast. So the feast is going to be the third Sunday in May, and we are going to put communion. Somehow, we are going to incorporate communion into our meal. Because again, that's what they did. So let's at least try it. Let's see what kind of transformation could take place if that happens. Now, we'll probably do it the first Sunday as well, so it'll be two communions in May. Because um, we don't want anybody left out. But anyway... So let's see what we see today and how we can adjust and reorient our lives to him. Now this is Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Um, <clears throat> suddenly a sound 
like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these... Uh, aren't all these who speak Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? And then verses 9 and 10 talk about all these different people groups. Verse 11, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. And amazed and perplexed, they ask each other, what does this mean? And some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Verse 14, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show you wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Luke is remarkable in his construction because Luke wrote Luke, obviously. Luke wrote Acts. Do you know what happens at the very beginning of Luke? In the very beginning of Luke, there is a spirit conception and a Bethlehem birth. In the very beginning of Acts, there is a spirit conception and a Jerusalem birth. Very, very um, remarkable construction. And so we have so many questions about Holy Spirit. But today I only want to deal with a couple because they're answered in this text. Um, how does Holy Spirit's arrival connect to the birth of the church? And how does God bring that forward into our time and our church and our lives? So one thing that we got to remember <clears throat> um, is that, like, for example, Moses said in an address to the people, this is back in Numbers, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And if you remember, or we just read it, Joel prophesies this moment where all people, men, women, servants, children, all people will have um, the opportunity to be receptive of Holy Spirit. It's, it's an extraordinary uh, promise. And this Pentecost moment, oh, what a change. You've probably heard before, like in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came on this person to do this thing. And that's kind of it, right? But in this moment, Holy Spirit's outpouring is on all of Jesus' followers. See, um, in the past... It was one person for one thing, basically. And now, the Spirit comes on everybody? It, it, it's truly, truly remarkable. It's the reason, probably, why there were tongues of fire and the sound of a wind. Because those were both things that were very well known in the Old Testament as evidences of God's presence. And so Holy Spirit's outpouring effectively creates a new temple, which is the church. And it's so clear. One Holy Spirit, Rick talked about this, one Holy Spirit shared among each of us followers so that all are filled. That's the important part here. How does the Holy Spirit relate to the birth of the church? Holy Spirit in every believer is the birth of the church. See, before that point, uh, we'll talk in a minute, by the way, about what the simplest evidence of Holy Spirit in a person's life is. Um, 
But just for a minute, think about what, what that means. If, if Holy Spirit is now on every single believer, there is not a single spectator in this room or that will watch this someday. None of us are watchers. Every single one of us. See, in the Old Testament, it's like Holy Spirit lands on that guy for this task and the rest of us are like, well, I guess we better follow him then. Holy Spirit, or, or the Spirit of God was put onto this guy to do this project. That guy needs help. Everybody else is like, oh, okay. And they do it. But now, Holy Spirit is on all of us. It, it, it's, it, it's fantastic. The Spirit in each so that all are filled. That means that flame is with you wherever you go. That flame is with you in the classroom, in the boardroom, in the bedroom, in the kitchen, when you go shopping, when you go to the bank, when you talk uh, anywhere. You get, you get the point. That flame is with us. Anywhere and everywhere you go, God can and will shine through you. That's why I'm so excited about the reports that I get back from y'all. Where this person is praying with this person in an office someplace. And this person is talking about Jesus to this person in a classroom someplace. And this person, it's just so exciting. This person is out in the community and just like, I don't know, fishing or something with a buddy. And the buddy says, you know, I got some issues and some things. And, you know, this person says, well, can I tell you? That's exciting stuff. Really, I, I wish that y'all were more public about it. I, I'm gathering people over at the house to study this thing, this book. I really appreciate that uh, Tanya has talked about um, grace and studying that book. That's awesome stuff. The spirit in each so that all are filled. By the way, there's no diminishment with the distribution. You know, if I had a cup of coffee, which I don't know why I would because I don't like coffee, but if I had a cup of coffee and I wanted to share it with y'all, you know, we'll pour a little bit into each cup, right? And now everybody's got this much. But that's not how this works. When Holy Spirit arrives, the fullness of Holy Spirit is in all believers. It's extraordinary. And again, I, I can hear the pushback. Like, I don't feel full of Holy Spirit. I screw up way too much to be full of Holy Spirit. And I got good news for you in a minute. But the spirit in each, so that all are filled. That's how this works. So what is the evidence of being spirit-filled? Um, in history, uh, it's been the second blessing, it's been ecstatic speech, you know, speaking in tongues and, and other languages. Um, anybody old enough to remember laughing in the spirit? There was a thing in churches for a while. Barking in the spirit was a thing, believe it or not, in the spirit. Yeah, I can see the young people going, what? 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 Yeah, it was a thing in certain churches. We are always, we have so many questions about the Holy Spirit. We want to experience something so badly that sometimes things get a little crazy. And this is from the Brave Hearted Voices podcast. The ministry of Holy Spirit has become almost exclusively Christian-centered instead of being Christ-centered. God nailed it. Because all of those kinds of things that we look for, oh, I want to speak in tongues, I, yeah, that's fine, we'll, we'll get there, we'll talk about it. Um, I want this, I, I, I want this experience, or I, I had this experience, whatever. All of that kind of stuff is so self-centered, often. Not all the time. When Scripture is real, this is one of those examples where we got to readjust and reorient our lives around what Scripture says. Because Scripture is really clear what Holy Spirit does. Listen to this. this is, we studied these not long ago. John 14. These are Jesus' words. All this have I spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things 
and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So when something comes back, when you're reminded of a truth, when it's helpful, when, when the simple thought, Jesus loves me, this I know, when the simple thought, I think God loves me, comes into your head, that's not your head, that's Holy Spirit reminding you what Jesus said. And because scripture is really clear too that the Holy Spirit's filling happens over and over and over again, I think I can make the case that that's what that is. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is not always some kind of ecstatic <laughs> thing. The full, well, we'll get there. John 15, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. <laughs> John 16, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. The, the, the truth about what house to buy, what job to take. No, the truth about Jesus. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. This is the key verse. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. We truly have so many questions about Holy Spirit and there are so many expressions of the presence of Holy Spirit throughout history, throughout your experience maybe. But the one thing the most sound and consistent evidence that Holy Spirit is at work is this. Holy, uh, the holy ambition of the Spirit of God is to reveal and to glorify Jesus Christ. John 14, 15, 16, and a whole lot of other places that I could show you. The, 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 the purpose, the goal, the whole... Um, I don't know what to call it. Uh, the inner motivation, the, the, the oomph of Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus. So, as we keep studying Acts, you're going to see that Holy Spirit comes on these people and they speak in tongues. Holy Spirit comes on these people and they're able to do healing. Holy Spirit comes on these people and they feel compelled by the Spirit to go to other countries and share the gospel. Holy Spirit comes on this person and dot, dot, dot. But you know what ties all of those together? Is the glorification of Jesus Christ. So, that's why I can tell you, um, you all... Maybe even right now, 15 minutes ago, you were full of the Holy Spirit. Because if you were singing those songs and those words, those words glorify Jesus Christ. Now, nobody had some sort of weird experience. Nobody went, oh, nobody, you, you might not have even been moved emotionally. But if I'm right, and I think I am, if the whole idea of Holy Spirit, the whole push of Holy Spirit is to glorify Christ and the filling of the Holy Spirit is in each so that all can be filled then that filling the result of that filling is glorifying Christ I you know my struggle with, with worship. You know that I, I, I struggle to raise my hands. You know I'm self-conscious. You know those things. I also really, really like to just listen sometimes. And especially since there was a time where I didn't think I'd be able to listen anymore. <laughs> 
I mean, even before Steve brought up Jim and, and healing Jim, I'm, I'm standing there and I'm hearing individual voices behind me. Because you all, most of you, are singing. And my ears are clear enough that I could pick out individual voices behind me. And I'm telling you, that is the filling of the Holy Spirit because your voices are glorifying Christ. And I'm telling you that if y'all don't get it, I, I, I hope what I'm saying right now is a model to the rest of you because there are going to be days when you will come here and you don't feel like singing, you don't think it's true anymore, your head is down, you're frustrated, you're depressed, you're worried, you're whatever, and you're going to hear some other voice singing about the glory of Jesus Christ. And that person's filling is the each that fills all. Am I making sense? Am I preaching yet? It's so exciting. It's so exciting to be free from this idea that Holy Spirit has to be some sort of woof, some sort of touch your tongue to the line volt battery kind of experience. It just is glorifying Christ. That means that when, by the way, I, again, I hear the pushback, well, I, I, I screw up too often. You know what? Let me just tell you about that. Contrition and repentance glorifies Christ. When I started, when I became convicted and I started to repent in front of my children, it made such a difference. It made a difference first in me, I think probably then in her, and then in them. It wasn't immediate. But when, when I, like all parents, just do something stupid, you know, when... Uh, I was listening to a pastor the other day, and he said, he was telling a story about when he was a kid, or when his kids were little, and he's, he, they were so out of control and whatever else. He said, the words came out of my mouth, I'm going to take all the toys out of your room, we're going to put them in the yard, and we're going to set them on fire. <laughs> and, and he's like, <laughs> and, you know, as soon as you say it, and obviously, you, know, you laugh about it now, but as soon as you say it, you go, what am I doing? What am I thinking? What am I saying? And of course, it was not said in, the, in a comical way either. He was, he was roaring. He was angry. I think it was him, actually, that, that pastor, that, that <clears throat> where as he taught and I began to uh, reorient my life around the truth of Scripture, I think that's where I got the conviction that I need to repent in front of my kids. Because the rest of the story is he goes back to his kids and he's, you know, that was stupid. That was not Christ-like. I've already prayed and, and accepted Christ's forgiveness on my life. Well, however it worked out, right? But repentance and contrition, that glorifies Jesus. <clears throat> we'll talk about repentance at least just a little bit next week. Um, but that glorifies Jesus. Um, all for one and one for all from Three Musketeers. Uh, it's basically a rallying cry. Um, you know, we will fight for one another. We will fight for this cause. Here's what uh, Jesus offers through the Holy Spirit. One for all. And all for one. Dumas, the writer, was right. He just got the order reversed and he didn't put Holy Spirit in it. Kind of like my father-in-law did with Acts 2. When you get the order right and you put Holy Spirit in it, then you've got some power. It's not a rallying cop cry, it's a reality from which we live. One spirit for all, so that all of us, full of him, can serve one. Ordinary people. 
mostly outside the church will see in Acts. Carry that flame, glorify Jesus. That's fields. The whole point of fields was to be doing what you're already doing now and what we're celebrating now. The whole point of fields was to be the church outside the church, which is what we're going to run into. Um, yeah, enough of that. Uh, two closing quotes, and I'll, I'll pray and we'll sing. And I, ho I hope this has been encouraging to you, by the way. Um, that was my real goal this morning. I just... I want to strip away this notion that Holy Spirit has to be that touching your tongue to the nine volt battery, sticking a fork in the socket, setting your hair on fire. No, being full of the Holy Spirit consistently is glorifying Christ. So when you glorify Christ, I think that's it. There are so many things in the church that we have made so complicated. So many things in the church, so many things in Christendom that we have made so complicated, and it's really not. We just have to learn that more things count, quote unquote, than we think. This is a, a quote I've used many, many, many times, um, and I, just, I stumbled on it again while I was studying it. Uh, but this is... This is so well written, so well thought out. It's Dr. Armand Gesswein. I don't even know who he is. Um, but uh, old guy, I'll tell you that. The revival we need is simply a return to normal New Testament Christianity, where the churches were full of prayer, full of power, full of people, full of praise, and full of divine happenings all the time. We need what God calls normal, not what we call special. God's normal is greater than all our specials put together. And Father, that's what we're looking for. Um, God, I want your normal. Um, and, and, and we want your normal to encompass our lives Right? We, we want your normal uh, to be us reorienting our lives around the truth of Scripture. Um, God, brighten our week with the truth of who you are and what you're doing brighten our week with this truth that if, if, if I have salvation, if I know Jesus, then the same Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. Brighten our week with that reality. And I know most of us are like, no, 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 no. I got this little tiny bitty flame that's sort of smoking. That's not how I read that. Holy Spirit rested on each so that all could be filled. So let us trust that you are filling us. Let us trust the truth that as whacked and as messed up as we are sometimes, you're filling us. You're filling us for the purpose of glorifying Christ. God, brighten our week with truth. Encourage us. Convict us. Show us. Thank you for that. I'm going to look forward to that. And um, uh, and I pray that our people uh, would look forward to that, that they would experience that this week and be able to talk about, it, be able to share, um, testify <laughs> that this has been their reality this week. So.
as we close with uh, the song, um, let us glorify your name. Let us be filled with your spirit to glorify your name through this final song. In Jesus' name.